Tuesday, March 5th, 2024, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So today uh, we've got an interesting episode, in my opinion. First, we're going to look at what's going on right now. We're seeing uh, gold march ahead above 2100 in the US dollars. It's making new highs in other currencies. And the other thing uh, we've noticed as well, Clive and I, is that the FDIC quarterly report for the fourth quarter is not out yet. And according to them, uh, that quarterly uh, report is supposed to be out 55 days approximately uh, after the end of the quarter. And, and uh, according to my calculations, they should have been out uh, around February 24th. So Clive, welcome again. And what do you think about the FDIC and, and uh, why do you think gold is uh, pushing up now, finally? Well, hello, Mary. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Um, I think it's very odd that the FDIC has not published the report. Um, I think that indicates there could be uh, uh, possibly something to hide, but I would say more likely some kind of disagreement internally as to what they're going to say. And probably the disagreement is because it's not going to be good news. Um, that's the only conclusion I, I can reach, because normally these sort of things are on time. Uh, so is there something that they're trying to figure out internally which way to paint the picture? Uh, and I suppose the picture would be one of, do we have enough money to bail out all the banks which are going to be needed to be bailed out because for sure there will be some banks which are going to be in trouble as the real estate the commercial real estate market collapses um so we don't know how many there will be or how bad that's going to be we have seen some very large office blocks being sold for a single dollar uh completely worthless uh which means the collateral that the banks are holding on some of that real estate is not worth nearly as much as they lent um on the gold price, uh, I think people are becoming more and more aware that the government's debt problem is getting worse. It's uh, accelerating away. Um, there's no will at the moment to solve it, which would involve either cutting spending or raising taxes. Um, and realistically speaking, they can't cut the spending. There's, there's nowhere they can cut uh, because most of the spending is on uh, its mandatory, um, such as Social Security and and so on so they can't really cut the spending uh they could raise taxes but uh, i think that's like the turkeys voting for christmas so i'm not sure they're gonna raise taxes and that means the the deficit the budget deficit as planned is and it's going to be a big deficit is going to get bigger and bigger and that means they have to borrow more and more and the market's getting indigestion there's a limit to how much people want to lend the government and uh people are starting to say uh, how far away is the end before all this collapses? And obviously, one of the things you want to hold on to is gold, because if the system does have to be restarted, the central banks of the world, and it doesn't matter which country goes down first in a crisis, if one large G5 country goes down with a, with a, a, a currency crisis and they have to restart their currency, they will have to restart it back by something tangible. You can't start it with the same promises you had before you have to have a promise afterwards and a plausible promise and that plausible promise would be gold so i think people are buying gold uh because the central banks are buying gold and the central banks know exactly what's going to happen uh, that's why they're loading up on gold and uh the man in the street uh, is no fool if he you know he says uh don't don't fight your central bank if they're buying gold i'll have some too yeah, and, and we're seeing, though, that the Chinese, uh, even the Generation Z or Z, they call them, the young Chinese are buying a lot of gold. Uh, unfortunately, in the West, I don't think it's the same same thing. We're seeing a lot of people buy something else that we know about, you know, uh, Bitcoin and Dogecoin. I've seen that Dogecoin and other uh, coins have gone up like 30% or something. But just wanted to show the viewers, uh, we're going to do the market report here quickly before we actually go into history, but and but it is to do with gold, and I think it's, you're going to enjoy it. But you can see gold is up here, uh, 7 bucks. It's been up to 21.23. Uh, I, I guess the key level will be the high from December when we spike there from uh, over the weekend, from a Sunday to a Monday, around 21.50. I think we're already where we are just constitutes a breakout. 
But anyway, it's 8.41 a.m. as you can see here, London time. So if you watch this video later and the price is different, at least you know the time. Silver is, uh, yeah, has a lot of catching up to do and it's not up as much today. But you can see the stock market, Clive, uh, they're not doing that great either uh, here. And the currencies, I would have expected them to be up uh, a little bit versus the dollar, but they actually down versus the dollar so uh, let's stop here with the market and what's going on today. And um, recently I, I sent Clive uh, a copy of uh, this book, Illegal Tender, um, gold, gold Greed and the Mystery of the Lost 1933 Double Eagle. For some reason, I, I had two of these. I think I bought one for someone and uh, I forgot to give it to that person and never an acquaintance. So I had two here so uh, a month or two ago i sent uh posted the other copy for clive i thought he'd enjoy it and lo and behold he did enjoy it uh so uh clive uh before you start i just wanted to let the viewers know why 1933 is so important well that was the year that uh fdr uh, made uh monetary gold like uh, a double legal that i have here and, and other coins in the U.S. It made it illegal because there was a bank run. People wanted their gold. Uh, the system was going to collapse. Uh, and uh, the government needed needed the money. So they made it illegal until 1975. So uh, what happened was that a, a few uh, people at the Mint, I, I think the Mint had already started minting the 33 double eagles by the way this is a 1908 if it was a 1933 i would probably not be sitting here but um <laughs> or probably i would but i wouldn't show it to you but what happened is the the mint probably had minted 33 double eagles and they held it um and they're supposed to melt it so uh, i'll leave it to you now clive uh to talk about your your view of the book and uh it's a it's a great story and there's something related to the book after the book was written, that was really interesting too. Uh, well, it's, you know, this is a, a fascinating story. And unlike most stories, the chief proponent of the story is not a person, not a crook or a murderer or anything like that, or a politician. <laughs> uh, sorry to put, put them in the same camp. But the pro chief proponent of the book is the story of a coin and the strange journey it took uh, until it had a climatic ending, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, but first of all, I'd just like to um, let your new viewers know a little bit of history about gold in the United States. So way back when, back uh, the, they had the coinage acts from, uh, starting in 1792. And the coin back then was the gold eagle, which was a $10 coin. And the, they had multiple coinage acts. But the, the bottom line was gold was set in stone as being the currency of the day. And the dollar was a representation of the currency, and it was defined, the dollar was defined under the Gold Standard Act as being 25.8 grains of gold. Now, we would know that today as $20.67 per ounce, but they would look at it differently. A dollar represented 25 grains of gold. Now, come the Great Depression, 1933, uh, after the stock market crash of 1929, we had many banks starting to fail. Um, in all, during that period, I think there were 5,000 banks failed and people weren't getting their money back. So people were uh, starting to go down to the banks and it wasn't moving at the speed of light as it does today with your mouse because there was no uh, digital thing. You had to vis physically visit the bank to get your money out. But people were taking their money out in gold. And the gold coin of the day was the gold double eagle. A very popular coin. Well, it was the coin. There was also the gold eagle, which was $10, but the double eagle was the $20 coin. So if you went to get out any substantial sum of money, uh, you'd be taking out the gold double eagle from your bank and tucking it away under your pillow because that seemed to be safer than leaving it in the bank because literally people who'd borrowed money from the banks couldn't repay their debts. And yeah, no, no, banks no, were, count, no counterparty risk. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and, and people, you know, the banks were were becoming insolvent one after the other. But th there was another uh, 
problem, which was the economy. As the gold was being drained from the system, there was no liquidity in the system to restart the Great Depression, uh, restart the economy from the Great Depression. Um, and Hoover was in charge at the time, uh, but he didn't seem to be able to do much about it. But the day after Roosevelt was elected as president, he was a man of action, and he immediately ordered and this was on the 4th of March, 1933, he ordered what's called a bank holiday. He shut down the banks, and then he started to lecture the country. Um, he called the lectures the the fireside chats, and this was done by wireless in those days. And in the fireside chats, he would reassure the public that when the banks would reopen, because they're all going to be checked for solvency, those banks which did reopen would be absolutely safe, and you could put your money back in the banks and have no worries at all. So during this bank holiday, and I'll just read a couple of lines from Roosevelt's speech uh, to the public. This was one of the fireside chats. He said, it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime. <laughs> so he's tried to sow the seeds that you should be hoarding. And then he wrote or said, I can assure you that it is safer to keep your money in a reopened bank than under the mattress. So when eventually they did open some of the banks, people did queue up to put their money back in the bank. But needless to say, not everybody believed those words and not everybody was ready to return their money. So the money was not coming back at the speed it, they wanted. And the, the situation was getting more and more dire because the money wasn't circulating in the economy and greasing the wheels of the economy. So he, a month later, he issued what's known, and everybody knows this now, what's known as the Executive Order 6102. Executive Order 6102 said to the public, you've got to hand in all your gold, except for $100, and you can't hoard gold, and you can't trade it, you can't buy it, you can't sell it, you can't export it, you can't do anything with it, except if you have a license from the government. So, most people, or many people, duly handed in their gold coins, their $20 double eagles or their $10 eagles, to the government. To, uh, they handed them to the Federal Reserve, to be precise, uh, for melting down. That was uh, all very well. But you can imagine plenty of people said, I'm not handing my gold into the government. And they buried them in the garden or tucked them under the pillow and didn't do anything. Now... We're going to get to this double eagle, and I'm just putting up on my, my screen there uh, a picture of a double eagle, the one which Mary just showed you. Uh, they had minted in 1933 nearly half a million gold double eagles, which were to be put in circulation, but never got put into circulation because it was illegal by then for the mint or the government or the treasury or anybody else or the banks to give out gold to the public so these half million double eagles sat in the mint's vaults for next four years before they would be melted down philadelphia mint yeah the philadelphia melt mint indeed now uh, st they still hadn't collected uh, well, they collected enough gold to issue some paper currency, but there, there was still a problem because the paper currency was now, the gold was now held by the Federal Reserve and the government didn't have enough money to pay its international bills. So on the 31st of January, on the 30th of January, 1934, a year later, the government passed a law called the Gold Reserve Act, which basically sequestered all the gold belonging to the Federal Reserve and said, it's ours. And they gave the Federal Reserve in return what's known as gold notes, which are not redeemable in gold, they're redeemable in lawful currency. And lawful currency in the same act became dollars, not gold. So the Federal Reserve, whilst they had these notes called gold notes, uh, actually can only get dollars for them. Uh, all very well, but the next trick was a real rabbit out of the hat from the uh, government. The next day, the president issued a proclamation in which he revalued the gold at $35 an ounce, a six, in other words, 69% more than it had been, and all of that profit accrued to the Treasury, to the government, and not to the Federal Reserve. So you can imagine the Federal Reserve was a bit peeved at this, uh, but there's nothing they could do about it, because uh, the gold was now the government's. 
Uh, but we now have a situation where we've still got all these $20 gold coins out there worth only $20, even though if you melted them down, they're worth $35. Maybe a little less because the $35 was for an ounce and that gold coin was actually uh, a little less than an ounce, but it, that, that's just the technicality. But yeah, yeah I, I simplify it. Mean, I, I, a double eagle is almost an ounce. Yeah. Now, th this discrepancy wasn't lost on the gold dealers. The the people who were the the the, the gold dealers who had collected the uh, jewelry that people were selling, because they could melt the jewelry down and sell it to the treasury, or rather to the mint, for thirty five dollars an ounce. But if you took a gold coin back to the Treasury or the mint, you'd only get twenty dollars. So you can imagine that some dealers were slipping a few of these gold coins into their melting pots to make an overnight 69 percent, sixty sixty one percent profit. And now I'm going to turn to the uh, one of the proponents of the story, who is a person, but he had some involvement with what we're going to talk about, which is the 1933 Double Eagle, and his name was Swit. So in 1934, after the, after the Gold Reserve Act, after the executive order, after it was illegal to hold gold, this man Swit, who was a jeweler in Philadelphia, not far from the Mint, he was caught boarding a train carrying a very heavy suitcase, and a suspicious policeman interrogated him, and it turned out his suitcase contained $2,000 of gold double eagles. I think they were not, they weren't 1933s, but they contained about $2,000 worth of gold eagles, which should have been handed in under the executive order. Uh, anyway, he was taken to court and, uh, the, and tried. Now, Swit did say, I was planning to turn them in, but I was kind of worried that if I would turn them in, I'd incriminate myself for having them in the first place. So I was looking for a way to turn them in, and I was just carrying them to another another, uh, another town. Um, obviously, the suspicion might have been that he was planning to melt them down as he was a jeweler. The judge wasn't having any of that and basically said, Switz withholding and transporting the gold with intent to violate the act the fact that he hoped at some time in the future to obey the law's commands did not excuse his present knowing violation of it. And those gold coins were confiscated. Now, he got off very, uh, he, he was a, it was a very lucky escape for him because the penalty for hoarding gold was up to 10 years in jail. And all that happened to him, to him was having his gold coins confiscated. $2,000, of course, was a lot of gold to confiscate. Anyway, we've got back to the we go back to the double eagles. They've all been melted in 1937, four years after they were minted. But in 1944, Clive, so can 19... I interrupt you a second? Not trying to be rude. Uh, 1937 was also the year where they completed the the construct the building of uh, Fort Knox. So uh, all all the gold they confiscated went into uh, Fort Knox in Kentucky. So there you go. In, in the form of bars, which we trust are 100% gold is gold. <laughs> anyway, uh, so come, come 1944, some 1933 double eagles, which are not supposed to exist because they've all been melted, started to turn up in people's coin collections. They started to turn up with dealers. And one was advertised in a coin auction by a company called Stacks. They were auctioneers as part of a collection. And a newspaper journalist who covered the numismatic section of the newspaper noticed that there was a 1933 double eagle for sale in this auction. So he wrote to the Mint to ask the question to try and find out how rare it is, because obviously they were rare coins. There weren't a lot of them out there. And he wanted to know exactly how rare it is. And the Mint responded, well, it doesn't. It shouldn't exist. All these coins have been melted down. There shouldn't be any in circulation. That triggered a secret service investigation, because you can imagine if a coin's got out there, it might have been stolen from the mint. At least that's what the mint might claim, since they hadn't issued any to the public. It would have been illegal to issue them to the public. 
And if $20 or $40 can escape to the Mint, so can $4 million. So it was a serious secret service investigation. The first thing they did, they visited uh, Stax, the auctioneers, and and seized the coin and asked Stax if they knew of any others. And Stax said, yeah, we know somebody's got one. It's this collector over here. And so they went to that collector and seized that coin. And they wanted to find out if these coins were either stolen or counterfeit. And they tested them at the Mint, and they were found to be genuine coins. And then they set off on an investigation to find out how those coins had got out, who the culprit was, and if there were any more. And the mission they had was, if they get any of these coins, to send them to meet their maker in the melting pot, in the cauldron of the smelter, where they belonged in the first place. And as they investigated, interviewing coin dealers and uh, coin collectors, they gradually, little by little, found out that there were several of these coins out there, and they would visit the dealers, they would visit the collectors and say, give us our coin. Now, the threat they made to get those coins back was you're handling stolen property, and that's a criminal offence. Maybe you didn't know it because you bought it legitimately, but now you know it's stolen. If you don't hand it over, you're committing a crime. So a lot of the collectors, being law-abiding citizens, duly handed over their 1933 double eagles. Uh, but there were a few who said, I'm not giving it to you unless you prove it's stolen. And they went to court and the government instituted forfeiture proceedings, uh, which in turn lasted several years. But unfortunately for the collectors, there was still a lot of um, bad feelings about the hoarders, the people who've been hoarding gold. So when the coin collectors went to court to try and keep their coins, even though the government's, government was struggling to prove it had been stolen, um, and one of the reasons the government couldn't prove it was stolen was the, the mint itself was missing nothing. You see, the mint kept meticulous records right down to the last one hundredth of an ounce. Every coin, every ounce of gold, every gram of gold was weighed before it, uh, when it arrived, it was weighed when it moved, it was weighed when it arrived at its new destination, it was watched by multiple pairs of eyes, it was under seal, under lock and key. So and the books balanced perfectly. Not even a nickel or a dime was missing. So as far as the mint was concerned, they'd lost nothing, or so they thought, but they were wrong. Something was missing, but they, they couldn't, they, it was, their books balanced. So proving that these coins were actually stolen was, was a tricky job for the, uh, for the Secret Service. But the courts, having this negative view of hoarders, basically found in favour of the government and said uh, they accepted the supposition that the coins must have been stolen and ordered the coins to be handed over by the collectors and they were duly put into the melting pot. But, well, before all this started, back in 1944, before the investigation by the Secret Service started, one of the coins had been sold by a dealer to King Farouk of Egypt. And King Farouk's agent had taken this coin, this gold coin, the 1933 double eagle, along to the mint to have it certified and approved and authorized for export. Don't forget, it was illegal to have gold coins. There was an exception for numismatic coins. So was a 1933 gold eagle and numismatic coin. Well, 1933, well, let's put it, double eagles were very common, but not the 1933 version. Uh, and the fact that the King Farouk had paid $1,575 for a, $25, a $20 coin, uh, perhaps at first sight to the person who gives out the approvals, it, that might well have seemed like enough evidence on its own that it must be a rare coin. Uh, or maybe the fact that it was King Farouk made him turn a blind eye. But long and short of it, King Farouk got his export license and was able to export his coin before the Secret Service investigation into how these coins got out started. Now, uh, I said the Secret Service wanted to find the culprit, and they started asking the collectors and dealers, where did you get your coin? And many collectors had bought it from another collector, had bought it from a collector, had bought it from a dealer, had bought it from a collector, had bought it from a dealer, and they traced them back little by little to their original source. And funny enough, all these coins seemed to come back to one source, which is our man Swit, the man who'd been caught carrying 100 coins uh, on boarding a train. It seemed that, if not every gold coin, but certainly many of them seemed to come back to him. 
So they were going to interview this man, Swit, but they also had been along to the Mint to try and find out if there was an accomplice in the Mint, because Swit did not work for the Mint. So if the coins had got out, there must have been an accomplice in the Mint. And they found their accomplice. It was a man called, uh, they well, they couldn't prove it, but they, they suspected that the former head cashier, his name was George McCann, and he had been fired for pilfering in 1941. He'd pleaded guilty. Uh, he, uh, George McCann had been caught with two 25-cent coins, hmm. which which had been planted by the Secret Service. So the P Secret Service in 1941 uh, had, uh, had carried out a sting operation to see if there were any pilferers at the mint. So they'd taken in some bags of old silver coins, which they'd dosed with a fluorescent fluid so they would glow in the dark. And they handed them in to change them to new coins and waited to see what happened. And sure enough, three different employees in unrelated incidents turned out to have these coins on them. And so three people were prosecuted. And one of them was the head cashier, George McCann, who was found to have two 25-cent coins. One was in his clothes in his locker, and the other one was in his pay packet. And they found some other coins hidden or scattered around the mint in secreted places, which they supposed might have been under the control of George McCann. So obviously he was the suspect because he was the one who also would have handled these 1933 double eagles, which had got out. But there was more, as they dug deeper, there was more and more dirt on George McCann. They discovered that in the early 30s, when he had a much more junior position in the melting room, a bag of five thousand, uh, ten thousand dollars worth of coins. That's five hundred coins, had miraculously vanished. No explanation. The discovery of the missing coins had been found out by the head bookkeeper, who reported it to George McCann's bosses at the time, and blatantly accused George McCann of being the thief. He didn't mince words. He said, "George McCann's the thief. I know it." They carried out an investigation, but George McCann was on very good terms with his bosses, and eventually he wasn't absolved, but the bosses decided to write down this missing uh, 15 kilos of gold as wastage. <laughs> now, that was an extraordinary decision, given that even one hundredth of an ounce has to be investigated, but that's what they did. It was wastage. A few years later, in 1937, another bag of gold coins, also under the watch of George McCann, miraculously vanished. Uh, there was a Secret Service investigation at that time, and they discovered that the coins had actually been stolen in 1933 before they'd been locked in the vault. And once again, the suspect was George McCann, but there was zero evidence to prove it. So he, the, he was not charged with anything. Uh, but the Secret Service uh, had to find somebody to pay the price. And the person they found to pay, pay the price was his new boss, who hadn't been employed at the time of the theft. He hadn't been employed at the Mint. Um, and the new boss had failed when he uh, joined the Mint to carry out a full audit, which would be customary. And because he'd failed to carry out the audit, uh, even though he's not the thief, even though he was not the suspect, even though he wasn't employed at the time of the theft, they charged him with paying the price of reimbursing those coins. And not only did he have to reimburse at the uh, old $20 price, he had to reimburse at the new price of $35 an ounce. Uh, so this man, the head of the Mint, whilst completely innocent, was made to pay the price. It was like, uh, it's as if someone asked you to pay half a million dollars today for a crime you haven't committed. And so he was very aggrieved. So when the Secret Service came asking about the missing coins, the missing 1932 double eagles, you can imagine the boss, I think his name was Dressel, uh, you know, he had an axe to grind. He, he was very happy to share his suspicions about McCann with the Secret Service. And uh, his his assistant minced no words and said, McCann's the thief. Uh, so the Secret Service knew who it, as far as they were concerned, they knew who it did, was. It. So they interviewed George McCann and said, have you ever given out any gold eagles? Answer, no, I've never. I, McCann denied everything. He denied everything except knowing Swit. Yes, I know Swit, but I've never, I've never dealt gold coins with him, uh, he said. Of course, 
that's the kind of thing he would say because stealing from the mint did carry the death penalty at that time, potentially, and he'd only spent a year in jail for his previous theft, so I don't think he was going to admit to a second theft. Uh, long and short of it was they interviewed Swit, and Swit was asked where he got the gold coins which he sold, and he said, well, I bought them here and there. I bought them from dealers on different dates and different collectors, and they said, who do you sell them to? And he gave them a list of the people he'd sold them to and how much they paid. And then they asked him, who did you buy them from? And he switched, said, well, I can't actually remember the names of the people. It's My memory's gone. Well, can we see your records? Ah, the records seem to be missing. So Switt had no records of how he had acquired these coins, but there was no evidence that he'd acquired them illegally, even if there were some suspicions. They asked him, do you have any more 1933 double eagles? Because if you do, we've got to go and melt them down. And Switt said, absolutely not. He denied it. Meanwhile, the Secret Service thought they'd collected in all the gold coins which existed from 1933, except the one which was owned by King Farouk, which was now in Egypt. And there were discussions about whether they should approach King Farouk to ask him to return this coin. And on political grounds, it was decided that as Egypt was a friend of the United States in the Middle East, it was not the best time to ruffle any feathers, so they let it lie. But in 1952, there was a revolution, a military revolution in Egypt, and King Farouk was basically overthrown and he abdicated, and the government confiscated all his assets, including his coin collections, and he had a vast coin collection. And in 1954, the government of Egypt decided to auction off his coin collection, and this 1933, the last one, the last one known to exist, this 1933 double eagle was part of that coin collection to be auctioned in Cairo. So the Secret Service get to hear of this, and they say, they write off uh, through diplomatic channels to the Egyptian government saying, we'd like to have our gold coin back, please. It's not your property. The Egyptian government did withdraw the coin from the auction, but then did not return it to the United States. And despite writing many times to Egypt, the Egyptian government absolutely ignored every communication from the US government about this gold coin. They just didn't reply. So effectively, the 1933 double eagle had vanished. That was until the mid-1990s, when an Egyptian dealer turned up in London and sold a 1933 double eagle, along with some other coins, which were widely presumed to be part of King Farouk's collection. The London dealer, delighted to have this extremely rare coin, was looking around for a buyer. And somehow the Secret Service in America got to hear about this. So they set up a sting. Yeah, Clive, with a fake I buyer. interrupt you a second. Uh, that's the London dealer here, Stephen Fenton, and he's the Indeed. owner of uh, Knightsbridge Coins. And I've actually uh, gone to some coin uh, expos in London in the last few years, and he he was around. Uh, he's a nice guy. Um, and another thing, uh, Clive, you spoke about stacks earlier. Um, after I read this book, I, I was still working in the city. I had clients in New York. So when I went to New York to visit them, I went to Stax and bought some coins. They're still around, Stax. Excellent. Anyway, this is uh, Stephen Fenton, the London dealer, was enticed by the Secret Service to America, uh, pretending to be a buyer for the 1933 Double Eagle. And he, off he went to United States and uh, was about to deal the deal when the Secret Service pounced to the sting. They arrested him. They couldn't really charge him with any crime because it's not illegal to sell a coin that you don't know is stolen. But they arrested him anyway and gave him a few frightening days. And they also confiscated the gold coin from him, which they planned to melt down on the grounds. This is the King Farouk coin, which they on the grounds that they thought it must have been stolen or purloined or somehow got out of the mint in 1933. Now, they had to start a order for confiscation. Uh, and Stephen Fenton, along with his lawyer, 
decided to fight the confiscation. And the court case uh, arguing this went on for some years as they argued backwards and forwards as to whether it belonged to the owner, uh, Fenton, or whether it belonged to the government. And, of course, there was some evidence that it should belong to the owner because, of course, this coin had exited America with a, uh, an export license from the Mint. So how could it not be a legal coin? Uh, how could it be an illegal coin? After some years, the lawyer struck a deal with the American government whereby the American government would allow the coin to be sold, provided that Fenton, the owner, would give him, give them half the money. 50% of the proceeds. And it duly went to auction at Sotheby's in 1992, uh, 2002, big one, 2002. Up until then, the all time record for any coin had been $4.1 million. This coin, when the hammer fell down, was went for $6.6 million, which, after you allow for the 15% buyer's premium, was over seven and a half million dollars. An all-time record, smashing the record by more than 50%. You can see here, Clive, that um, in 2021, it sold again, uh, sorry to interrupt you, by uh, for $18.9 million, the double eagle coin. So there you go. Yes. Now, now that's, that's where the story of this book ends. However, I did a bit of digging, and the story doesn't end there. So, Clive, should we do a part two for that? Uh, well, I I think I'll entice people to go and look at my LinkedIn page where I have written part two. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I'll just give a little hint. Yeah, maybe we could do another video uh, and uh, we can talk about because I think it's also important, the lesson to be learned uh, about what happened, because I didn't know about what happened to some other, uh, well, in part two, because it's not it's not in the book. <laughs> let, let, let me just say a very small hint. Some years after the auction sale, one of the heirs of this man, Swit, who'd been dead for many, many, many years, opened his safety deposit box something was glinting inside and i'll stop there great great clive that was a great story told by you uh you're a good storyteller and uh i highly recommend this book for for people who are into coins or gold numismatics or just in you know stacking uh and, and it teaches you a, a lot about what happened in 1933 and um uh, you have to probably do a little bit of research if you want to really understand this book. Uh, I, I think I bought this, uh, well, it's an old, uh, I think it's the first edition. Uh, when was it? Back in uh, 2004. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why uh, I went to Stax. I think it was probably 2005 or six, And I, I bought a few, uh, few silver coins there that I still have. Uh, and I think now it's called Stack uh, Bowers or Bowers, uh, but they're still in New York. If you're in New York, uh, you can go to Stacks. Uh, and I'm not affiliated with them, by the way. So, Clive, any final thoughts on this uh, saga of the double eagle? Well, if anyone's got a coin collection, uh, and many people love collecting double eagles for, of all the years, which go from about 1859 through to 1933, just have a look. You might potentially have one of these extremely rare and extremely valuable coins. And if you do, keep your mouth shut. Great. Thank you, uh, Clive. And uh, I'm going to wish the viewers a, a great day as well. And uh, you too, uh, Clive, and take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Mario. Bye. -bye,